Greetings, stranger. I'm glad you found me before nightfall. Eskadar's streets are seldom safe to stroll through once the moon rises for the uninitiated. I have instead committed myself, therefore, to this inn for the evening. I plan on celebrating another successful tour of Absalom before departing for the next adventure, though I admit that I do not yet know whither it will take me. Before all that, though, I wish to recount the lore of another strange creature to you. I have selected the Barghest, a monstrous fiend that stalks the misty forests of the material plane to satiate its endless hunger. The Encyclopaedia Galarianensis is one of the few legitimate sources of information you will find on them, for it is only in recent years that scholars, lawmasters, and adventurers have been able to discern the finer points of their ecology. For many years, bar guests were considered little more than the wargs to Hellhound's wolves. Now, though, it is known that they are something far more sinister indeed. So, pour yourself a tankard of something suitably strong and pay close attention to what I am about to tell you. It may well save your life one day. Bar guests come in two varieties, the regular and the greater, but unlike many creatures detailed in the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galarian, these do not refer to two distinct types, but rather to two distinct stages in the specimen's life cycles. What's more, greater bar guests are considered mutants, meaning that their bodies have undergone considerable and fundamental transfigurations from their original plans without the assistance of polymorphy, although that talent is also available to them. Indeed, these mutations more or less define the differentiation between themselves and their planar scions. Consequently, there is no single description that can capture every nuance and identifier of a bar guest but there are commonalities that can linger between them. In general, a regular barguest is beheld as something of a hybrid between a wolf and a goblin. It resembles the former in size, posture, and hirsuteness, being inclined to travel on both its front and hind limbs, and being covered in a shaggy, grey to black fur accompanied by a mane of darker hair running down from head to tail. Its goblin-like features are found mostly in its face, which is tinged yellow-green and characterised by goblins' squatness. The principal differences are found in the nose, which is more porcine than goblinoid, and the ears, which usually resemble bats, but extend past the top of the head a disproportionate distance, often for longer than the length of the face itself. A bar guest's front limbs, whilst functioning as legs, are actually better described as muscular arms, because they are shorter than the hind limbs and end in clawed hands rather than paws. Perhaps for this reason, a bar guest is not faster than your average humanoid. In fact, it is slower than all true canines and lupines. It is a false comparison, however, for a bar guest is actually a fiend of the outer plains and, as such, is additionally resistant to fire and all physical injuries not rooted in magic. Now, what it lacks in speed, it makes up for in strength and cunning, for a bar guest is a resourceful, disciplined and patient hunter. It is recorded as a fiend of chaos, largely due to its species history and preference for individualism in its early stages, but it would be a grave error to group it with the true demons of the Abyss. Bar guests can restrain violence in the desire for future rewards, a calculation unknown to most of its abyssal neighbours. This ability to reason is not instinctual either, as they are fully sentient beings capable of speech. Moreover, all bar guests possess a number of spell-like abilities that complement their predatory nature. They can levitate themselves off the ground, allowing them to scale surfaces and pad silently across the ceilings and forest canopies of their hunting grounds with a grace otherwise unavailable to them. In direct confrontations, they are also able effortlessly to blink in and out of the ethereal plane, effectively teleporting through space over short distances, leaving their next striking spot unpredictable. At the cost of considerable energy expenditure, bar guests can extend the distance of this teleportation across a great distance, permitting a quick retreat if necessary, 
Seldom is this witnessed, though, because barghests are equipped with powerful jaws and rending claws that, when combined with their magical prowess, are able to subdue almost all prey without risk to themselves. Should a barghest feel the need to interact with another sentient being, it can finally call upon its subtler powers. You see, unusually for a being of its nature, it is able to charm and confuse its interlocutors through enchantment. To me, this is the most surprising and concerning ability, because their looks already work to disguise their cunning. When you see a barghest, wolf-like and snarling on all fours on a misty night, you are not reminded of a con artist or trickster, yet it is nevertheless a natural and accomplished liar. When augmented by its magical charms, engaging with a barghest is often more than adventurers are prepared to handle. The final power gifted to these creatures is polymorphy. Like the green hags we discussed yesterday, barghests can transform themselves and don new skins, though also like the green hags, they are restricted in their natures. Barghest polymorphy is limited only to goblinoid targets, meaning the disguises are almost always either goblins, hobgoblins, or bugbears. Furthermore, every individual barghest is only able to adopt a single goblinoid persona, so it cannot polymorph itself to don multiple faces. It is not known whether they decide the characteristics of their disguises, or whether it is predetermined. This does offer some relief for those tasked with tracking one down either way. Barghests can also transfigure themselves into wolves, but here they encounter the same restriction. Therefore, some of the more esoteric scholars of fiend lore have proposed that it would be better to consider barghests not as creatures with one form capable of polymorphy, but rather as creatures with a trinity of true forms. Personally, I think this overcomplicates the matter, but it is only fair to raise it for your own consideration. So, how do these creatures transform themselves into what we call the greater barghests? The answer lies in the consumption of the flesh of the dead. As outsiders, barghests do not actually need food or drink to survive, but they nevertheless frequently choose to gorge themselves on the bodies of their prey. These acts catalyze mutations in their biology that transform them from the beings I have just described into unique heralds of doom. While the realm of possibilities for barghest mutations is endless, Common transformations include the growth of wings, the emergence of vestigial limbs, or the development of venom glands that allow them to inject or spew deadly toxins. The mutations always lead to dramatic growth spurts, irrespective of their nature, and so the easiest way of differentiating between a regular barghest and a greater specimen is by seeing whether it is the size of a wolf or the size of a horse. Physical adaptations are not the extent of a greater barghest's differences, though, for they also develop additional magical powers. However, in contrast to the mutations, these are far more regular and rarely vary from specimen to specimen. The most notable magical development for a greater barghest is the ability to turn invisible at will, a truly terrifying thought for anyone hoping for an easier time hunting one. Imagine a venomous, winged beast the size of a destria descending invisibly from a blackened nighttime sky to rip you apart and feast on your bones, to get a sense of the danger these creatures pose if they are permitted to reach this stage. If that wasn't all, greater barghests are also able to enlarge their bodies to even greater sizes temporarily, comparable to those of many fully grown dragons. Truly, these fiends become exponentially more dangerous with time. Indeed, greater barghests may sometimes continue to feast on fallen corpses, accumulating more and more mutations long past the point of their own safety or longevity in the name of power. It is true to say that regular barghests are principally interested in reaching this greater stage, as they are driven by a relentless hunger for flesh until they attain it. The time it takes for one to achieve this is measured in months, not years, and the only reason most barghests ultimately fail to do so is due to their voracious appetites often besting their otherwise cunning natures, leading to confrontations with those who can hire monster slayers in retribution. It does not help that they commonly develop an almost snobbish preference for the flesh of sentient animals, 
leading to bargasts forsaking simpler prey in favour of hunting close to humanoid settlements. Once a greater bargast emerges from its lair for the first time, it is faced with an instinctual decision. Most answer the call of Lamashtu, the mother of monsters, to whom almost all bargasts swear allegiance and begin to seek some means of plainer travel, hoping to reach the lair of the abyss called Baselfeist, where their demigod ancestors still dwell. Others instead decide to seek out a goblinoid tribe to conquer, with the aim of amassing their own troop of worshippers and revelers over whom they would wield absolute authority. The decision to focus on goblinoids is not arbitrary, and in fact betrays an ancient lineage credited with the creation of both ancestries as we know them today. The original Barghests were bred by Asmodeus in the pit as a miscellaneous supplement to his legions of devils. Four of these were notably stronger than all the others, and it was these whom Lamashtu secretly approached and cajoled into her service. They stole away from Hell and found themselves on the material plane, where they could feast on the flesh of mortals to achieve wondrous mutations, all in line with the Mother of Monsters' designs. However, they soon discovered that from every drop of blood their victims spilled would emerge a small, green-skinned, thoroughly chaotic being, which delighted their new mistress even further. As a reward, and seeing the true potential of the foremost powerful bar guests, Lamashtu successfully conspired to transport an entire region of hell into the abyss, wherein she established it as a new layer named Baselfeist, and gifted it to her adopted children, whom she now elevated to demigods for their efforts. The new beings, meanwhile, became the first goblins, and it is still said in most of their tribes today that these four bar guests ought to be worshipped and revered for enabling the Greenskins' progenation. Indeed, these most powerful bar guests are referred to, even by us scholars, as the four goblin hero gods, and they are called Hadragash, Venklvor, Zorongel, and Zogmagot. They are the direct ancestors of most bar guests today, and their origins as servants of the Lord of Hell explain why the creatures behave with careful, calculating patience, despite making their home in the unpredictable, chaotic abyss. I hope that you can now see why it is no coincidence that many of the largest goblin tribes operating across Galarian are in fact led by one or several greater Barghests. Most notably, in 4071, the River Kingdoms witnessed the meteoric rise of the Kingdom of Zog, a coalition of many goblinoid tribes and clans under the wrathful watch of no fewer than seven Barghest rulers. This oppressive coalition lasted for over 200 years, an unprecedented period in the River Kingdoms, and was only ended after the goblins were overwhelmed by the Yellow Tongue Sickness that swept through the area in 4217. Even today, in 4723, remnants of Zog's tribes are still to be found all across its former territories and holdfasts, and many a dark cave has remained unlooked for and untouched since the sudden collapse of the polity. Other parts of Galarian notable for Barghest activity include the Greenbelt region of the River Kingdoms, the county of Canterwall in distant Ustalav, and the Mana Wastes between Nex and Geb in Garund. You might encounter one in rural hills or suburban towns, during the day or in the depths of night, in the coldest winter or the hottest summer. So it is best you are always prepared, lest you be their next victim. Well, stranger, there we have the bar guests. I hope you will agree that they are far more complex than their rather rough appearance would intimate. Many people think that your soul is forfeit if you fall prey to one, but fortunately I can reassure you that there is no evidence of this. I suspect their origins as servants of Asmodeus and subsequent hunger for sentient beings' flesh has evolved into this rumour, but you will not have difficulty resurrecting a victim. Nevertheless, I strongly encourage you to bring magical weaponry and healthy caution to your next encounter with one, or you are likely to need to put this speculation to the test yourself. Now, I must dwell on my next move, as they say. I will spend the next while poring over my maps and charts of Galarian, and the cosmological planes in which it resides, so I suggest you make yourself comfortable. Feel free to wander a little more first, though. 
as uh, I'll summon you when the time is right. Well, until then.